to me and said, no, I want you to talk about identity. And I was like, haven't we beat that horse to death? You know, about Christian identity and all that? And he said, no, I want you to talk about identity. Go further. I was like, well, what are you talking about? And then he said, look up the meaning of identity for a start. And so um, as we get into this, you know, I think the most common thing now is like Christians, I think of their identity as a, as a son or daughter of God, right? Isn't that mostly what people think of as their, their identity? I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. That's, and that's true. But that's a real generality as far as identity. So let me just uh, read you the actual meaning of what identity is. It's the state or fact of remaining the same one or ones as under varying aspects or conditions. In other words, you are who you are no matter what situations or conditions are. You're still you. Secondly, the condition of being oneself and not another. There is nobody else that can be you, the job's taken. You're the only you that can be you. Now, this has to do with your identity. You're the only one that can be you. And then the last one is condition or character as who a person or what a thing or quality is and concerns beliefs that distinguish or identify a person or thing. So that's kind of wordy, but our character and what we're known for as the person we are that nobody else can be also identifies our identity. Now, that doesn't mean that if you uh, find yourself being shamed that you, your identity is shame. So, First of all, I want to get into what our, our identity is not. Um, the, the word identity is, I, if I could say this right, huios in the Hebrew, and it meant the first sons of Adam. So everybody actually, and they use sons, and I, I was investigating, why, why is it always sons and never daughters? Well, the reason is, this is kind of a strange reason. The reason is, is because... God didn't want to confuse sons and daughters with the sons of God who are actually angelic. And it says that the sons of God actually had relations with the daughters of men. So when you look in the Old Testament, it will often say the sons of God, but then it will say the daughters of men. And that's why it wasn't really, I don't think it was really meant to be a gender slight. But anyway, that's the way it's played out in the Old Testament. That's what was brought forward into the New as well with the Hebrews. And so the etymology of the word sons is really, it means all of humanity, not just, son, not just male persons only, but all of humanity. And so my, my point in bringing that up uh, might be controversial to some, but it's this. Everyone is act, who is born is actually a child of God. Some people don't like to say that. No, only Christians are children of God. That's because unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom, but he gave a right for those who believe to become the children of God. But that was, that was actually you know, making a special notation about those who believe. But if you look back in the Old Testament, everybody in the Psalms, everybody is a child of God because we're all born from the Creator. You got, in fact, you got your identity from the Creator as a person. That's where your identity came from. And Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but yeah, I kind of am. Let, let's, let me just say what, it, what your identity is not before I go into why I'm, why I'm saying that your identity comes from God. And every, every person actually has an identity. It's not just Christians who have an identity. Hello? Everybody has an identity, whether you're a Christian or not. 
But what, what um, identity is not, it's not your work or profession. If you're an electrician, that's not your identity. If you're a school teacher, that's not your identity. If you're a farmer, that's not your identity. That might be a part of who people know you by, which is linked to your identity, but it's not centrally your identity. Neither is your birth place or your nationality or ethnicity your most prominent talent or gift or your gender. None of those things are your identity. Now, this is important today because we have a conflict of cultures. And probably the most divisive thing that's going on in the conflict of cultures really has to do with identity, if you think about it. There's what's called identity politics, and there are some who take different things that people call identity that are not identity, and they grab onto that to get votes. And what it does is it divides us. You want to know why we're such a divided nation? Because I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, you're that, right? I love what Alveda King said, Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, niece. She said, actually, there is no such thing as race. There's ethnicity, but we are all one blood. Boy, that's controversial. If there's no race, then I guess there's no racism. You know what there is, though? There's prejudice and bigotry. There is that. There is prejudice and bigotry and hatred. But there's not really such a thing as racism because we are all one blood. And this goes back to chapter 17 of the book of Acts. I wish I'd have brought my Amplified, but I'll, I'll use the Passion. It says it pretty clearly. The true God is the creator of all things. This is in verse 24. He is the owner and Lord of the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. It means he pretty much owns everything. And he doesn't live in man-made temples. He supplies life and breath and all things to every living being. He doesn't lack a thing that we mortals could supply for him. For he has all things and everything he needs. God has everything he needs. From one man, Adam, he made every man and woman and every race of humanity. It says race of humanity here, but it should say ethnicity. He spread us all over the earth. Because, see, we're, this is what defines ethnicity is what I'm about to read. He spread us all over the world or the earth, and he set the boundaries of the people and nations determining their appointed times in, in history. Did you know that, that God actually is all about nations? We, we talk about going to the nations, and we laud missionary movements to go to the nations. But again, in, in this conflict of cultures, now there's a big push to, to get rid of the idea of being a nation, that it's wrong to actually identify with your nation as a person. Like I live in the United States of America. No, let's get rid of all of our borders everywhere and become... That is part of a globalist movement. That has nothing to do with the way God designed things. I, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but I mean, I'm going to say things that, that the Bible says. I'm not, I'm not going to get caught up in the culture conflict and buy into stuff that's not true. And it's not true that God hates nations. Hello? And it's not true that God wants everything to be looked at in, as a globalist kind of thing and that nations have no, no uh, kind of identity themselves. Like, that's part of identity too. Like, a nation has an identity. America has an identity. England has an identity. A lot of these different nations, you know, they all have, well, actually, they all have an identity, and God set their boundaries, and he put them where they are, and it says for a reason. Determining their appointed times in history, he's done this so that every person would long for God and feel their way for him and find him, 
for he is the God who is easy to discover. It is through him we live and function and have our identity, just as your own poet said, our lineage comes from him. Now, the globalist thing actually tries to erase all that. If you notice, the globalist movement, wherever it exists, there is less and less belief in God. Wherever it exists. We don't need God because humanism is more powerful than the thought of anybody believing something as silly as a creator. That's absolutely what's been going on. And if you look at Europe, where the European Union is, where they've lost their national identities, which now England's going to get it back with Brexit, where they've lost that, it's almost in vogue to be atheist and humanist. They're the, trying to go into those places, like I've, I've preached the gospel in Paris and in France, it's hard ground. Germany's hard ground. Everywhere that they're connected to the European Union, it's hard ground. Ann and I went to uh, Strasbourg, France. It's the last time we were in France. And when we were flying in, it's a beautiful country and the infrastructure, you can see it all laid out very orderly and everything. And we had just come from uh, Uganda where we were with Mike and Lori Sally, who uh, Justin and Emily are with them today. We were with them at their place at Show Mercy, and Uganda is a mess as far as infrastructure. But you know what? They have more joy than anything I saw in France. Everywhere we seem to, to talk with people, it's like thoughts of suicide, depression, on this antidepressant, on that thing, you know, all kinds of problems in that regard. And it was really, really hard to break through to bring the gospel to them or to even actually empower the church. Whereas in Uganda and stuff, I mean, it's like very easy to bring people to the Lord, get them healed, all of that stuff, right? But those people identify with their own nation so much so that they have tribes and they have kings and they have all of that stuff. And, like, identity is a big deal to Africans, but identity is not a very big deal to a humanist because we're all on an equal playing field. The only problem with that is, is it's way down here. The, the common denominator for the level of everybody's life is way down here. And it gets lower and lower and lower as you try to pay for everything to be the same. And so I'm, I'm just telling it like it is. God is actually even going to judge nations. He's not going to join. He's not going to judge the European Union. He's going to judge the nations within the European Union concerning whether or not they fed the poor, they helped the sick, they, they visited people in prison, and all of those kinds of things, as it says, you know, in the Gospels. Jesus talked about the separation of the sheep and the goat, where he judged nations. All that's going to actually happen to nations, and that's going to happen to our nation. So we don't want to lose our identity as a nation. Okay, so I'll get off of that. How about gender? Well, now there's a big movement. And honestly, I, I've been watching some old Turner Classic movies, like 30s, 40s, stuff like that. They're really fascinating movies. The reason I started watching this is I wanted to know what the time period was like. You know how women were treated back then? Shamefully. Men were like unbelievably abusive even in the movies towards the women. Even Hollywood was like really abusive towards the women in the movies. It was horrible. So we have come a long way, baby, in that regard. But gender itself is not an identity. And God made male and female, those are DNA, you know, factors that have to do with how we're made as a human being, our sexuality, but our sexuality is not our identity. If that was true, you'd see everybody fighting for, hey, I'm a, I'm a heterosexual. 
you know, you don't, you don't hear heterosexuals fighting for an identity. The reason is, is they understood that from the very beginning, God created them male and female and then said, the man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall be joined together as one and then they would have children. I'm not trying to be offensive, I'm just trying to be biblical, okay? That, that is actually the way it is. So gender is not your identity either. And neither is, let's see here, what, I had a couple other things here. Oh, your gifts and your talents. It's really in vogue in the church, you know, like to identify with your ministry. No, if you're a, in the Old Testament, actually, a, some of the names alluded to a person being a prophet or a king because those were the only two things that really had to do with God, you know, and his connection to the people except for the priest who atoned for their sins. So those three things, the prophets, the priests, and the kings. And so sometimes a name would actually go to identify a person as a prophet. But still, if you think about it, even Samuel was not the same as Elijah. Elijah was not the same as Zechariah or Jeremiah. They all were very unique and had their own identity, right? According to the person that God made them to be, knowing who they would be in history. Now I want to read you something from uh, Psalm 139. In Psalm 139, in verse 16, it says, your eyes, were un your eyes, I saw my unformed substance, saying, God, your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book. All the days of my life were written before ever they took shape, when as yet there were none of them. How precious and weighty also are your thoughts to me, O God, how vast the sum of them. If I could count them, they would be more than the number of the sand. And when I awake, I still can't count them to the end. I, I'm still with you. So it says that um, all of these were, God, God, all of these thoughts about us and, and our, God's foreknowledge, he knew all the days of our life. And it actually says, and it doesn't say this in the Passion Translation, but it says in, a, in the, uh, New King James, and in the Amplified, it says, all the days that of my life were written in your book beforehand. Now think about what I just said. All the days of your life were written in God's book beforehand, before you were ever born. God knew you before you were ever born. He had a purpose and a plan for your life before you were ever born. And actually, he knew, because of foreknowledge, the name that you would get before you were ever born. And this is what I'm, the Lord wanted me to get to today. I've taken a long time to get here. But your identity, if you want to know what your identity is really about, there, there's two things. One is, once you, once you give your life to Christ, and he calls you, it says, many are called, few are chosen, but he calls you. He may call you by name or he may just call you some other way, but he speaks to you about what your purpose is in life. But your name actually will somewhat reveal your purpose in life. This was true of many of the people in the Bible. Now today, we have all these names that are not in the Bible. So I'm not sure how this they came up with this, but... God knew they would come up with this. And today, if you have, like, I saw, I saw this is really kind of funny. They, they were shaming this woman on the plane. When they, they looked at her daughter's ticket, her name was A, B, C, D, E. And you, they pronounced it something like um, Abdi or something like that, or Absdi or something. But... So they were like, what kind of name is that? You know, that's the alphabet and everything. Which, you know, leave the poor woman and her daughter alone. But, but that's the thing. See, today we have all of these nuances. 
So it's not going to be as easy. If you have one of those names, it's not going to be as easy to find out the meaning of your name. But you can go, and I don't want you to go on the Internet now. We ask you to turn the Wi-Fi off. But, but later, you can go, and there, I, you'll have to do some search because at one time I had a really good uh, site where you could go in and find out the meaning of your name. Now, I don't know why there's so many of them out there. The best ones don't come up where it's just simple, very simple. But take, for instance, like the name Abram. Abram meant exalted father. God changed his name because of his purpose later on. I don't know how he got the name Abram from uh, Terah, his father. I mean, Terah named him, but his father. But God saw his purpose and, and his real plan for all of history, which was later on, he changed his name from Abram to Abraham, which meant father of a multitude or many nations. Are you, are you following me? His name meant something. Exalted father, but his plan and his purpose for life was to be, actually, they have called him the father of faith. Everybody in the Jewish culture still looks to Father Abraham as being the person who started the whole thing of the Jewish line and everything. And he is the father of a multitude. He's the father of nations. Not just a nation, because Ishmael was one of his uh, sons who now we have all of these Arab nations and all of the Arab nations come from Ishmael is this too complicated okay so so your name means something and you can look up on a website and find your name go do a, a search for name meanings given name meanings like I said you're gonna have to do a little research because some of them get all fouled up, and they just, you know, you'll find a good one, though. And I'll, I'll show you here in a minute about some of that. Um, but I want to talk about my name first, what my name means. I was back in Tennessee visiting Bob Jones, and before I got to Bob, he was upstairs uh, praying for somebody. And so I walked down to see if I could talk with him because I didn't know the, the leader of this church and Viola was there and Viola goes well Danny Dennis do you know what your name means that was her greeting she she hugged me and gave me a kiss on the cheek and she says do you know what your name means and I said yeah actually I do she said well let me let me see if you do she said it means lover of fine wine that's actually one of the meanings. And then um, one of the other meanings of it is, is um, carrier of wisdom, Dennis. So my calling and my purpose, bringing it forward to my calling and purpose is not to be a drunkard on wine. <laughs> Lover of fine wine, guess what? God used me in the renewal to spread renewal all over the Willamette Valley. With, and what did they call it? The new wine. I didn't know that was going to happen. That was part of my purpose and calling. And then when I got into leadership in the church, when God called me, he said, I want you to teach the whole gospel. And the first thing that I asked for was, guess what? Not knowing what my name meant. Wisdom, because I knew I would need wisdom if I was going to do that, because I didn't have any. Believe me, I didn't have any wisdom. I wasn't raised in the church. I knew nothing about being a leader in the church. And so the first thing I asked for was wisdom. So what, what is your name mean? Do, do any of you know what your name means? Some of you do? Yeah. What, what does your name mean? Warrior. Did you like look it up or? Okay. All right. Sam, what's your, well, Samuel. Huh? Yeah. Or it means um, 
I actually have Samuel as an example here. Let's see. What did I do with it? Okay. It's a little bit different than ask of God, but um, it's actually more weighty than that. What did I do with it? Actually, it actually means um, of the Lord. You know, not only ask of God, but it means of the Lord. And so, uh, Elijah, his name was, was the same way. It was very similar as a prophet. His meant um, God the Lord or the Lord strong. That's, that's what Elijah means. Anybody else, you know what your name means? Yes. Patricia, is that, is it Patricia? Okay. Huh? Nobility and honor. Now, did you find that by looking it up on some given name? Yeah, okay. That works. Yes. Truth. Surely means truth. That's awesome. Yes. Is it Catherine? Or Catherine means pure one. See there? And... Yours is really interesting. It's grace, but it also has more than that to it, which is really interesting when it concerns, you know, like um, your act the way you actually operate as a person and leader given to education, humanitarian. Yeah. She didn't know that when she was born. You know it now. I didn't, I didn't look yours up, honey. You'll have to look it up. George, from the Greek, means farmer, earth worker, or work. Now, I don't know if that means any, to the two Georges that are here, I don't know if that means anything to you guys, but does that mean anything to you, George? Yeah, and, you, and, and like you work like crazy, don't you? So... Well, I, I wouldn't say like crazy. A hair farmer. <laughs> he grows hair. That's a good joke. So you get the you get the gist of this. Um, so our identity is who we are as an individual, made in God's image, with a purpose and yes, even a plan for our life. Some people don't like to to say that God has a plan for our life. The reason is because we have a free will and we go in and mess it up. And so they have a real issue with that, like preaching the gospel to people and say God's got a plan for your life. He actually does. And the fact that we mess it up doesn't mean that we can't redeem it and we can't get it, you know, turn that around. We can. So God has a purpose and he has a plan for our life. But we have a lot to do with how that plays out according to our beliefs, our willingness to pursue God in, in, in obedience to Him. And it starts with our birth even before we have faith, but can't be but completed as a believer without faith in Christ. So God knows all the days that are set before us, but then on our side of it, because we're made in the image of God, we have a free will, we actually... You know, our work is to, to actually have faith and be obedient to God to, to walk it out. But God has all of this stuff, and that includes grace and favor to accomplish it all. I, I was thinking about um, the judgment seat of Christ. It's talking about the judgment of nations. Believers are actually going to be judged too. I don't know if you realize that, but believers will be judged too. And it actually said for everything that's done in the body. 
Jesus said he'll call every word to account, you know, but, but in the end, it's all for rewards. And I, and I, I really consider this because it's like, I used to think, well, as long as I get in, that's all I care. But that's really weak-minded thinking to just be like that. We should actually want to fulfill the purpose God created us for to the best, you know, be the best person we can be, the best version of us that God made us to be, right? We should want to be that. And so because of that, you know, some of us may be really disappointed at the judgment seat of Christ momentarily when we see what we didn't accomplish and then we get the rewards for what we did. And we are going to receive rewards as, his, as believers in Christ and followers as, of Christ. And so the judgment seat of Christ is only for believers. It's not for unbelievers. Unbelievers have an entirely different judgment called the great white throne of judgment. People don't like to talk about that, but it's real. It wouldn't be in the Bible if it wasn't so. And uh, you don't want to be in that judgment. The third thing here is like, when we are given a name, God knows that as well. Like he knew my name was was given to me. Guess who gave me my name? Well, yeah, in a sense, that's probably true. Verily pointed to heaven. It's like God did. But you know what? My parents didn't give me my name. They're, my dad got fired from his coaching job because they only got second place in the state in this little town in Iowa, if you can imagine that. And on the same day he got fired, the apartment burned down, with, and my mom was not only pregnant with me, but about to give birth to me that day. So she goes to the hospital and gives birth to me. They didn't even have a birth certificate for me on record because they didn't have a name yet. It was a seven-pound something or other ounce boy who was born to Virginia Klein on March 20th, 1949. They have that, you know, but they didn't have a name. A week later, my dad goes to Schick the barber, and he said, congratulations on your son. What's his name? Well, we haven't named him yet. And Schick the barber gave me my name. <laughs> Why don't you call him Denny? Dennis. <laughs> and my dad was like, yeah, that's pretty good. Fine. So... Thankfully, I don't think he gave me the second part, which is Michael, which I really like, because, you know, Michael is the archangel, and um, let's see if I can find what Michael actually means. Yeah, who is like God? Thank you. I should know. Who is like God? I'm having a hard time living up to that one, frankly, but, but that's my middle name. So how did you get your name? Some of you say, well, I didn't know my parents. I don't really, you know, I didn't grow up in a two-person household with a mother and a father, but I have this name. So... How many of you know where your name came from? I found out later. Some of you don't actually know. Is that right, or are you just not raising your hand? <laughs> wow. Interesting. But God knows. That's the thing is God knew. God knew Schick the Barber was going to name me. And he knew that Ann's parents were going to name her. More conventional, better. And it's interesting, you know, a lot of people used to name their kids biblical names. Why? Because you could easily go and find a meaning to their name. And, and people would even pray, What's, what should we name this child? And God would give the name. But more and more and more as time goes on, that's not true. Doesn't mean God doesn't know, though. 
Remember Psalm 139. He knew you even before you were in your mother's womb. All the days that were appointed for you, they were written in his book. He knows. So you, and your name actually means something. Now I want to say something else concerning all of that because we have parents, right? All of us have parents, unless you came from Mars. We all have parents. And people are very focused on generational curses, it seems like, in the charismatic movement. I find that a little bit hard to swallow, being how Jesus became a curse for us on the tree and took that to the grave with him along with our sin. But you know what he didn't take to the grave with him was our blessings. The blessings of Abraham go on and on and on to every generation of believers and all those that come to faith in Christ. And actually, our parents, God knew our parents just like he knew us, and there are blessings that were on their life. I think it would do us good to look into our parents and find out what are my generational blessings. Not my curses, but my blessings. So to summarize, our identity is who God made us to be. That includes a plan and a purpose for us. and includes our character, gifts, and callings. and includes in bearing the image of Christ as a son and daughter of God. But it also, you can find out and know that your name will give you clues to your plan and your purpose in life and who you're really made to be. Some people may not believe that, but it's played out to be true. Look at, look at Anne not having any idea that when she was a little girl, at least I don't think you thought you were going to be a teacher when you were a little girl. Maybe you did. Did you? No? And here she's going to, you know, it says someone given to education and a leader and a humanitarian. She really carries all of those kind of character qualities in her. Whether you've come to faith in Christ or have not, you still have the same value in God's eyes as every human being. God loves everyone and is good to everyone. Read Psalm 145. God is good to everybody. It even says he's good to the wicked in Psalm 145. I, I probably have more problem with that than God does. Our la however, our faith or lack of it in him as, and our willingness to pursue the purpose that he has created us for, that's what determines God's favor and pleasure over our lives. Even having said God loves everybody, he's good to everybody, but you don't get the favor of God on your life and the pleasure of God over your life without a relationship with God. That comes from having a relationship with the Father. So, and Jesus made the way for that. So I'm encouraging you to investigate the meaning of your name and your family history to know the blessings of your family line and, for, and to look forward, not backwards. And I'm going to close with this scripture, which is what I shared uh, during the worship time last week. This really jumped out at me when Jesus called his disciples to follow him. Jesus turned to another and said, Come, be my disciple. And he replied, Someday I will, Lord, but allow me first to fulfill my duty as a good son and wait until my father passes away. Boy, that, that just really strikes me. Think about that in terms of identity and only camping on sonship. Let me, let me first go fulfill my duty. Let me first allow my duty fulfill my duty as a good son and wait until my father passes away. Just putting away the whole thing of wait till my father passes away. Just, I will serve you someday, Lord, but it's just good enough to be your son. Someday I will follow you, but I'm just glad that I'm your son. That's kind of like, well, I'm glad I'm going to heaven, but I don't care about my rewards, right? It's not much different than, I'm just glad that I'm a son, but I don't really care about my calling and purpose. I'm just glad I'm a son. 
Well, Jesus actually had more to say about that. Don't wait for your father's burial. Let those who are already dead wait for the death. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere God's kingdom has arrived. Still another said to him, I want to follow you too, but first let me go home and say goodbye to my entire family. To me, this is like going back and trying to dig up every curse in your family line and say goodbye to it. I got to do that before I can do anything with God, before I can follow Jesus. He had something to say about that. Jesus responded and said, why do you keep looking backward to your past and have second thoughts about following me? Boom, into the future, into the kingdom. When you turn back, you are useless to God's kingdom realm. Not saying don't get healed up. Like this morning we had a word, like if your, your heart's broken, God's here to heal it. Get healed up. But don't keep looking back to your past. I can't, I can't, I can't because of my past, because of my parents, because of my family line and all this stuff that's hanging around me. And the enemy keeps reminding me of it. Jesus said, if you do that and have second thoughts about following him when you, as you turn back, you're not any good for the kingdom of God to go forward. It's kind of a hard saying, but I think it's an important saying. We really can't afford in the body of Christ to have all of God's people sitting around looking over their shoulder. Looking in the rearview mirror. Wish I would have, could have, I would have, I would have, except. It's like that really cool video that Emily showed a few weeks ago from the gal, I think, from Australia, you know, saying, well, I'm going to do this tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I really like the way she said it, tomorrow, you know. And it just kind of got in your head. I'll do it tomorrow. No, actually, don't wait till tomorrow what you can do today. Jesus is calling you to follow him today. And you say, well, I don't know what my calling is. And this is why I think God brought this up, the whole thing of identity. It's because we were camping on sons and daughters. Even our language is we want to raise up sons and daughters who will become mothers and fathers, who will raise up sons and daughters, you know, who will raise up who become mothers and fathers, and on and on and on, generationally. We do want to do that. We absolutely want to do that. But in the meantime, nobody can be you or offer to the body of Christ who you are and what you carry and what your identity is and what God made you to be. Nobody can supply that but you. It's, you're, you're more than just a son and daughter of God. You are a person who's a son and daughter of God with a name that has a purpose and has a calling. And a lot of people come to me and go, well, I don't really know what my calling is. I don't know what my purpose is. Well, first of all, ask. I fasted and prayed for a week and asked God what he wanted me to do with my life. After I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I fasted and prayed for a week. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? Sort of a, in the charismatic movement now today it seems like sort of a odd thing to do to actually spend a long time seeking the Lord <laughs> to actually like, get on your face and seek him till you find him but that's what I did and then God visited me in the middle of the night and said I called you to preach the whole gospel he I'm no respect he's no respecter of persons I, I was right before that I was a head custodian of a school so it has nothing to do with your profession or any of those things. Your identity has to do with who God says you are and who he made you to be and what he wants to do with your life. And we really can't afford to have people in the body of Christ sitting around saying, well, I will do it, so I'll follow you someday, but I'm kind of content to just be a son or a daughter. Because I, keep, I love to just keep hearing how much God loves me. He does love you. We need to be reminded that God loves us.
But that in itself is not going to move you forward into your calling and destiny if you don't ever pursue it yourself. Is this all too, you know? Well, I'm actually done, but um, <laughs> I don't really have any more to say on that except I just encourage you to, to look into this and pursue this. Like, don't stop at sonship or being a son or daughter of God. Go deeper into who God made you to be, who you really are. And the Internet name thing will help some, but... Probably the best thing you can do is hear it from God himself. Yeah, Teresa? Yes, ma'am. Um, in closing, I just have to say this because it's blowing my mind. On the way over here to church today, um, I'm a writer, and so when I write books and have characters, names are huge. You don't name a character Dave or Mike or John. Those are great names, but... The names are really important. And my husband, beloved, Dave, um, on the way to ch church this morning out of nowhere, I was just thinking of Dave, and I have never liked the name Dave. And, <laughs> and not that I don't like it, it's just that it's Dave. And it's Denny, and it's John, and it's Mike, and it's Bill. And I've always, I love nicknames, and I've always like to come up with names for people on the way to church this morning. And I thought, I should call him David. And I thought, no, there, I know so many Davids. And Beloved came to my mind. And I thought, yes, I'm going to start calling my husband Beloved all the time instead of Dave on the way to church this morning. Yeah, and so, <laughs> and I hadn't told Dave yet. And you started talking, and I said, oh, my gosh, Dave, this is what happened on the way to church this morning. I feel like I'm supposed to start calling you Beloved. And so, like, my name means harvester, and I wouldn't want someone to call me harvester, but, um, <laughs> you know, you have a middle name and you have a last name. And I think what Denny's saying is your identity is so deeper than you even think in something as simple as a name. And it might sound Native American or something, but I challenge us all to come up with, you know, to address people by their identity. It, just for fun, if nothing else, just, you know... Uh, wise man or hey teacher you know whatever just you know to try it I think what you said is so much more profound than we're thinking and I say that because of what happened really yeah true. wow that's amazing you know and if if somehow one of the more modern names was like negative ask God who you really are he'll give you a different name he changed names in the Bible he changed a really negative name with uh, Jacob which meant supplanter, heel grabber, to uh, Israel, Prince of God, because that was who he was called to be. Real quick. One more thing. I had an opportunity 40 years ago to study with a Yemenite Jewish woman, a little Hebrew. Her father was an Orthodox rabbi. They grew up in Jerusalem. And I learned that when, according to the Orthodox Jewish tradition, that when God changed Abram Abram and Sarai's name to Abraham and Sarai, he took the hey, the consonant of his very own name, and put it right in the middle yeah. of their name. Yeah. And so it's really a prophetic picture of the Holy Spirit. Every one of us who are Christians who have received the gift of the Holy Spirit, it's very core in our identity. Amen. Amen. See, so this is, this is a good deal. And like I said, you know, all these modern names, maybe they have this, maybe they have no meaning yet you can find. Go ask God what he says your name is, and he'll tell you. And maybe some prophet will, but, but um, you know, and from now on, you can call me who is like God. <laughs> so it's like, no. I'm just kidding. So. <laughs> That's my Indian, my American, that's my Native American name. <laughs> so the Native Americans had some pretty negative names for their, their folks, but uh, I'm hoping to see that change when I go to Hayward, Wisconsin this summer. So anyway, is this helpful anyway? I hope so.
a little bit further about identity. Yes, we are sons and daughters of God, but we're more than that. We all have a purpose and a plan over our life, and, we, and our name suggests who we really are and who our identity really is. So, Lord, I just want you to seal this, Lord. I pray that, that people would find out all the good stuff that you say about them and who they are personally that nobody else can be. Lord, would you just bring a real seal to each person's identity so that they'll say, don't, won't have any excuses to wait for somebody to die or, or to just revel in being a son or daughter of God, but they'll say, no, I'll follow you today, not tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys.